Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Cognitive Science Show. This is episode eight of Transcendent Naturalism. And of course, who else would I be here with but Greg Enriquez, uh, my ongoing partner in all of the various versions of the Cognitive Science Show. <laughs> and we are also welcoming back uh, Brendan Graham Dempsey, who gave us an excellent uh, uh, presentation of the way he's stitching my work and Greg work, Greg's work and his work together uh, to address uh, a lot of the uh, issues surrounding the proposal of uh, transcendent naturalism. So uh, I'm going to turn things over to Greg, and then he'll welcome Brendan. And then we're just going to let Brendan uh, tell us where we're going to be going here, and then we'll do our usual shtick. So uh, welcome, Greg. Lovely. Yeah. So I, what I thought, um, what I was really excited about last time, and, and why we're excited to have Brendan here, uh, was the way you laid the groundwork, Brendan, for sort of the evolution of energy, complexification, uh, bridging into Bobby Assyrian's work, and and really giving us sort of this picture, uh, which certainly is this idea that we're grappling with, that there's a layered ontology. And you, I thought you'd give uh, a lot of richness to that in setting the stage for what that was. And then, of course, our argument is that we're conforming, bringing our own cognitive epistemic grip to that. And actually, as we think of sort of a deep ontological continuity, that Rich Blundell talks about, we're seeing that conformity between sort of the ontological layerings and our epistemic organization. Um, and I thought you did a really nice job of uh, giving us your version of that in a way that's very congruent, but also filled in some really key points. And then we were trailing just as the series is about trailing that into our current state um, and thinking about where we are in relationship to our worldviews, what's happened with modernity, how do we decide what is sacred, what is available to us through transcendence, strong transcendence, um, what kinds of things do we need to do to bridge from the wisdom traditions of the past to identify that kind of uh, icons. We talked about the elephant sun god, kaleidoscope eye. How do we orient? What does that mean without becoming very confused? or losing sense, which is somewhat inevitable. How does that intersect with the times that we're in? And that's where I felt like we sort of brought us up to. Uh, and we were going to then take off from here for uh, the second episode. Yeah, great. Thanks. Yeah, that's that sets it up pretty well. Yeah. So I felt like we, we were starting to move into uh, sort of the space of what do we do with this? What does it mean for our current moment? What does it mean for... Um, not just sort of in like a temporal kind of chronological sense, but also in this sort of chirotic moment mm. sense of like, you know, how do we respond to uh, the moment with any of this? Um, and in that sense, I think is actually really crucial because it's sort of like what adaptive insight about the world does this way of thinking even offer us that can give us a more optimal grip that can actually help us, you know, continue solving these problems that we're facing, which are now at a very, you know, existential level. Um, so yeah, and 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 I think I think John was also asking and intuiting that this is bridges into some of these uh, conversations that have been uh, being explored by folks around a sort of reconstructive religious project of rethinking religion and the sacred, uh, resymbolizing it, and sort of developing mm -hmm. a language and a grammar for sort of a new worldview. Um, so I'll try to kind of pick up where we were and then see if I can kind of bridge that into that domain, because I think it's uh, that's really kind of where we're at with this. And um, so, yeah, so just summarizing briefly some of the stuff that we talked about last time um, in the sense of John talking about the leveled ontology and then bringing that into a UTOC framework and looking at that leveled ontology through the lens of, you know, novel systems of uh, information processing. Um, and and then tying that information processing to forms of meaning making um, and adaptive strategies in response uh, of entities to their environments. Um, now, I kind of then zoomed in on the uh, on the culture plane of that. If we're looking at uh, matter, life, mind, and culture progression, uh, we've got kind of different learning processes that are showing up in this informational processing as information becomes more complex and its uh, richness increases and structural complexity increases, there's more energy. So all these things are deeply tied together. And I tried to bring in the work of um, Bobby Azarian, uh, as Greg mentioned, uh, who does a beautiful job in his book, The Romance of Reality, that kind of frames this cosmic complexification process as a learning process. And so that's what I'm trying to plug into Greg work, Greg's work and John's work about seeing this happening unfolding through the stack as a sort of progressive uh, learning through complexification uh, process. And so then we have sort of structural learning at the matter level, uh, genetic learning at the life 
level, uh, cognitive learning at the mind level and symbolic learning at the, at the culture person level. And that's where we get into the whole realm of the sacred, I think, as we you know, tend to conceive of it as anyway, as sort of a symbolically mediated concept or set of praxis or, or, or beliefs, et cetera. And that's a lot where my work is focusing, is trying to track that progression through sort of the historical record mm -hmm. and looking at uh, the, the complexification and the deepening sense of the sacred through time as a learning process. And then this is, of course, kind of the key aspect, because the sacred then is what is both calling us uh, well, it's both what sort of deposits into the, our kind of collective representations, uh, versions of, you know, successful meaning adaptations, basically, like when we are successfully oh. processing that information oh. about our environment uh, mm -hmm. and have produced some kind of adaptive strategy in an individual collective way. Um, that gets enshrined, you could say, in kind of the cultural uh, collective mm -hmm. representations. And I'm using this term collective representations. It's sort of a sociological term that means mm -hmm. like uh, it's not just right individuals having ideas. It's also the roles that individuals play in sort of downloading the ideas from their culture, which Greg's, works talk, Greg's work talks about very well with the justification systems idea. Uh, but, and this then becomes key to what I think we'll be getting in now, getting into now, is that individuals also shape those collective representations. There's a, a dialectical sort of nonlinear process in which we're sort of forming ourselves and our ego structures by means of these uh, kind of culturally received uh, conceptions. Uh -huh. uh, and we are also agents in the world who are shaping them. So this oh. is where I think that the religious reconstruction project is fits in because, uh, and we talked a little bit about this last time uh, in, in the sense of what the learning process is sort of doing as uh, people bump up against sort of the limits of their world model, right? Their mental oh. map of reality, right? And that is sort of the occasion for learning, right? We develop our learning capacities through what Piaget would you know, call assimilation and accommodation. We're developing new schemas in order to assimilate our experiences to those. But when our uh, assimilation is not able to do that, then we are kind of confronted. We're bump bumping up against our environment, the objective reality of our environment in a way that we need to accommodate to. And then that's where learning occurs. Um, I want to come back to that idea because it's also really crucial for uh, thinking about the importance of awe and wonder. Uh, and Jonathan wow. Haidt and uh, Datcher, uh, I forget the last name of the other author, did a great paper on this, uh, basically framing awe as a psychological response to uh, vastness that forces us to accommodate more reality and basically move Peter past. Peter Keltner. Yes, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, so all of this helps frame, um, I think, this this um, way of thinking about the sacred as a learning process. And to just to finish that thought I was ma making earlier, that the sacred both sort of enshrines in deposited cultural representations our our past successes at doing wow. this, but it also uh -huh. kind of then serves as, as the as the assimilation template or the schema by means of which we interpret reality to uh to sense or intuit those things that might actually complexify our world model wow. right um and then you can begin to track this process in in cultural history and yeah when you do that and you kind of take these ideas about awe and you bring it into the work of say like um like rudolf otto talking about the holy mm -hmm. or the numinous experience right or even in the anthropological literature about uh mana uh that there's a sense and then we can watch this sort of a process unfold through history now at the present moment which is what we're getting at here i think what's interesting then is to appreciate that right now we're facing we're, we bumped up against the limits of our world model, essentially, right? We're, uh -huh. we're at the edge of chaos um, and things are breaking down. And unless we can undergo this kind of worldview phase shift, uh, we are going to see a probable regression into a more chaotic uh, uh, state of complexity, right? It either, uh, we're either going to, yeah, take it, assimilate, or uh, let's say, uh, develop a world model that we can take in an even more complex sense of reality through, or things are going to fall apart. And this happens at an individually and collectively sort of, uh, you know, nonlinear way. These things are feeding back into each other. So then I think the key here is to appreciate the roles that individuals can play when culture has sort of reached its limits. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that is something that we have to then take up the task of 
individually of saying, mm -hmm. all right, how do I explore this domain of the sacred? You know, what are my intuitions? What are my sensitivities to the transcendent? Um, and begin to then basically uh, give voice to those, to, to write them down, to externalize them, to objectify them, to put them back into culture so that we can collectively bring these kind of new symbolizations uh, together, ideally in sort of a, a new networked way that allows for new collective representations of the sacred, of the God concept, of the divine. Um, and so for me, this is where we start engaging in, in ideas like personal myth making, um, which might initially sound kind of almost new agey and it's kind of like, uh, oh, we're just going to make up our own stories. And that's not really what I mean by this. I mean, that there's something that uh, goes on in the individual religious spiritual experience that we can't get at a certain point from our collective representations if they're no longer kind of serving us for where we need to be and moving forward. And so we're sort of thrust back upon the individual to have the responsibility of, of exploring that uncharted territory. And here, you know, you can bring in the work of of Jordan Peterson and talking about this sort of heroic uh, hero's journey aspect of going from the known world into the unknown and coming back with new things. So um, I guess, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there and try to bring in some more reflections to this, but that's where this starts to go for me. Um, and, you know, we can kind of unpack this and see what this looks like, but that I feel like is the, where we wind up getting to with this learning model of uh, transcendence and the sacred right. uh, in, in our current situation. That's great. I'm I'm having very strong uh, John callings as I'm listening to this, and what I mean by that is, you know, <laughs> meaning in life, uh, in relationship to our realization on the edge of what we know, and 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 leaning into that. And I I have you know sort of this I this image of we have an island of knowledge that we're in, so we're always in the possibility of the infinite, but we're gathering. Um, you know, and and I have this image of like, okay, well, we can center ourselves in some sort of conservative center of what will be known all the way down, pre us, you know, down. That would be sort of like uh, all the way down to the standard uh, theory of elementary particle physics at one level, or or all the way down into our experience of being, and then expanding out into the possibility and finding the edge of relevance realization, where our task is to connect to that and connect in that and finding meaning in that uh, process. Uh, and although you weren't using those words, that was, a, that was the imagery that I was having in relationship to that in a pretty profound way. And then the issue is individually and collectively, what is that event horizon? Where are we in relationship to that process? And how do we feel our way into that? And how do we point to that as something, or can we cultivate that? Can we see that for the chirotic nature of our moment? So. Anyway, that, that I, was, I was struck by that image in John's frame that really aligns enormously with what you're saying as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I'd like to pick up on that and add to that and then I'll, 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 how you respond, uh, Brendan. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, uh, Leo Ferraro and I published way back in 2013 in the before times um, that uh, the Piagetian assimilation and accommodation maps very well on to mm -hmm the integration and differentiation process as a relevance realization, except Piaget didn't have a an explanation. It was a description. And equilibration is actually, he's looking for something like, you know, opponent processing that results in an optimal grip on the environment. Mm. So I think that translation that Greg is pointing to with his imagery, I think it's, I, I yeah, I totally agree. I think that's bang on. There's a second uh, note, which uh, Greg Greg's uh, beautiful image um, I think connotes, uh, which is a reconceptualization of the sacred, not as the perfect or complete, but as an inexhaustible fount of intelligibility that simultaneously mm. always shines in and always withdraws from our grasp because relevance mm -hmm. realization is incompletable and the world contains radical uncertainty, not just unfound risk or something like that, uncalculated risk. Yeah. And so I, th I think that, and then there's a third thing, and then I'll shut up, uh, which is, um, I would like to bring in beyond collective representation, and this if I, goes back to Durkheim, but there's been an ongoing discussion between Jonathan Pajot and I about this, about and, and the work I've published with Dan Chiappi, the three Rover articles, about collective mm -hmm. agency and uh, collective mm -hmm. agency uh, that can solve problems 
by using collective intelligence. And I put to you two prominent examples that dominate modernity, science, no one individual does science, and democracy, no one individual does democracy. They are collective systems for enhancing the relevance realization of distributed cognition in order to solve problems that can't be solved even by just by simple summation of individuals. And it seems to me that the religion also captured uh, those and even tried to at times represent them, the church, right? The company of saints, just to pick Christian examples, symbolic examples. Right. So I, I, I agree that there's collective representations, but if we pick up on this new notion of the sacred bound up with relevance realization, I think collective agency and, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and of course, I, I, I want, I'm introducing this term very carefully and, you know, and I have differences with Jonathan around this, but there's a lot of negotiation and also with Paul, but there's something like, uh, you know, a sense of spirit again, just like there's that about us. This is a mm. Tolikian notion that is not just any of our parts or any combination, but the emergent whole, that's our spirit. It's mind, body, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, it's our mm -hmm. capacity for self-transcendence in that way. And then there are something like, you know, spirits. And again, I know that this this is a dangerous term, and uh, I'm not totally happy with it. I, I prefer hyper agents, but of course, part of spirituality was wrestling with these, right? These these collective agents that often, you know, empowered and manipulated uh, collective representations. Propaganda is an obvious ease, evil example. Um, you know, toward you know, they there's a power there, right? And, and we know this kind of thing and. Um, and so is there also a place for in this layered ontology, a risk, uh, you know, a reciprocal reconstruction? I'm not saying we adopt the supernaturalistic or magical frameworks when we talked about spirits, but, you know, we, we've kept it in thumb things when we talk about, you know, the team spirit and stuff like that. Right. There's so in that sense, is there also a way to bring back the religious invocation of spirits. I mean, if we're talking about spirituality, it seems like we should at least bump into that topic in some fashion. And we can we do that in a way, I think we can, that is completely reconcilable with an enriching of transcendent naturalism. So that would be my, 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 so just like, yes, definitely relevance realization, definitely a new conception of the sacred that falls out of that. And then what do we say about collective agency um, in, in this fashion? And so okay, I'll, I'll can, go ahead. Can Greg. I drop in just a little quick thing and then maybe. Pick, so I, I interviewed Howard Bloom a little while ago um, uh, on you talking with Greg. Uh, and, you know, he, he's got a model of the universe very so similar to true knowledge. And, and what he's really tracking then is sort of the syncing up of systems. So his intuition fundamentally is about, and he always rails against entropy. He's like, ah, that's all. And I think maybe overshoot some of that. But nonetheless, his focus is on the syncing up. And, and I bring him up because he made an unbelievable impact on the music industry. He was consistently capable of identifying Michael Jack. You know, you look at his yeah. history and he, you know, yeah. accidentally launches the 60s. Why am I bringing him up? Because when I asked him, I was like, well, what did you do? He was like, I honed in on the individuals that were capable of raising the spirit. And you think he used that word, the yes. spirit of the audience, like like there was some individuals that had the capacity and he would watch them. Uh, I think he mentioned John Cougar Mellicamp. I might get it wrong, but whatever. But he, there was like a couple of artists that would go out yeah. and they would become the epicenter yes. of the collective renaissance, resonance. And in fact, they would be so spent afterwards. Some of them would get depressed or just be so exhausted, but they would become this felt resonance through the music, through the performance that would create a collective geist, a collective frame, yeah, a collective yeah. uh, that wasn't propositional, but it was harmonious uh, at multiple levels. So I'll just throw that in there uh, in relationship to something that he saw that I think, you know, is, is certainly in the ballpark yeah. of what a lot of people would be talking about uh, in terms of pointing to this phenomenon. Yeah. So this is, this is really rich. So let me, because there's a, so much here and I really want to try to work with this and hopefully not lose any of the balls that were thrown up in the air because they, they all are very directly related. Uh, so I guess the way, the, the way I'd look at that is sort of, okay, let's start with the collective agency aspect and, and spirit. Um, and I think that this is where some of these learning models, learning framing of this complexification becomes really important because it allows, it allows us to make a really meaningful distinction um so 
uh, if you look at the kind of Piagetian and the, the post Piagetian, you know, hierarchical complexity models, that's that, that kind of a model and, and, and what we've been talking about sort of based on uh, assimilation and accommodation. Um, one way of understanding some forms of spirit uh, are basically uh, as as uh, highly assimilatory um, interpretations of reality. So what I mean by that, right, is we come into the world, um, you know, basically the uh, the constructivist epistemology of, of, of Piaget says, okay, it's not a platonic uh, world of knowledge in which we have, you know, there are perfect forms that we like conform ourselves to perfectly, nor is this sort of a Kantian world that we conform reality to our minds. It's sort of both, right? And so by assimilating, well, by by accommodating reality, I can create schemas that then I use to assimilate to new information. And this is the opponent processing that's going back yeah, and forth. And exactly. as I do that, it's this bootstrapping process. Right. So what's interesting about that, though, is that we come into the world with some very simple assimilatory schemas, right, like sucking and crying. Uh, they're just they're just kind of built in. And from that, we kind of work up basically into abstract thought and philosophy and et cetera, because we're able to use these schemas that we have in order to make more sense of the world. More of reality gets disclosed to us as we assimilate them into our into our schemas and then find that they don't fully work. So then we have to accommodate them. And this process goes forward and forward, right? So you learn that, okay, I can't figure out exactly what this thing is. If I just keep putting it into my mouth, I've got to do some other things here and, and make better sense of the world. Um, and this is sort of the basic way. Now, how does this all relate to spirits? Well, because of this process, what we show up with in the world is largely subjective uh, ways of, of, of relating to things. We, 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 uh, our first major experiences are with other human beings and in social environments. And so we are basically, our schemas are, are very per person centric. They're very social, emotional uh, focused. Um, and so what the result is of that is that it, it becomes rather difficult and only with labor do we begin to see that not everything actually is person-like. We have to accommodate more to the world and see, oh, actually, you know, this thing doesn't behave like like my family and it doesn't have to do with, you know, emotions and feelings and that sort of thing. This is just an inert stone, right? And this process is 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 what kind of in Piagetian terms is is what you're tracking when you're moving from sort of the uh, you know kind of pre-operational stage into the formal operational stage, and you're able to make sort of mechanistic causal uh, you know connections in the world rather than sort of pre-causal subjectivist ones. Right now, what's really important about this is that this is a uh, this can be a way that we can bullshit ourselves, I guess, and 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 be wrong about the reality that's being disclosed to us if we are assimilating it to us and we are not properly accommodating to it, right? So if I look at the world and I see a rock and I say, oh, but the rock is mad at me, there's a spirit in it, then I have... Uh, I have basically projected something interior onto the rock that a more complete, or I shouldn't say complete, because to John's point, and I'll talk about this in a second, this is an infinitely receding thing, we need to talk about that, but a greater disclosure of reality would see that, oh, that that intentional aspect of that rock is actually something in me, not in it. And I can learn to, you know, in Jungian terms, withdraw the projection and all that, right? Now, now Piaget calls that animism. Uh, and, and we can see similarities in animistic ways of thinking and worldviews and ways of talking about spirits as anima, right? Um, now, the distinction that this all allows us to draw, though, is that I would say that's one form of talking about spirits, which I feel like largely modernity disabused us of, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. it disenchanted us of all of those kinds of spirits. But there are these other things that you're talking about, these hyper agents and these hyper objects and these things that are more complex mm -hmm. than our assimilatory schemas that we need to accommodate to that um, behave in ways that might have characteristics that are um, well, if not person-like, let's say, then uh, reflective of certain kinds of uh, capacities or, um, and, and this gets into issues of collective, you know, intelligence and, and how these things show up. And I mean, Durkheim talked about collective effervescence and things like that. There are things that happen when we all come together and either to make sense of things or even just to experience that don't happen individually in isolation. So there are these emergent phenomena that arise from more complex things. And we might 
very reasonably be able to frame those in spiritual terms. But that's the key, right? This isn't just a kind of neo-animistic thing where we no. say, oh, well, you know, we'll put spirits in the rocks again. What we're what we're gesturing towards is that there are and probably have been for a long time that also, you know, ancients were picking up on as well. And this is why it becomes kind of hard to disentangle the two, right? When you read ancient sources, are, are you picking up on something pre-rational or trans-rational? Mm -hmm, this is mm -hmm. sort of the key idea here. So anyway, mm -hmm. this learning framework allows us to disentangle those two things in a very helpful way, I think, and be able to say, okay, yeah, maybe we can let go some of the more assimilatory animistic framings of spirits, but it just gestures towards a, a broader complexifying universe where there are phenomena that exist that it might make sense to think of those things as entities in, in various kinds of ways. And here, you know, we get into potential danger zones and slippage and all sorts of things. So we have to be careful. But, you know, I think I think there's a, a broad kind of awareness of this idea out there, right? Egregores and these sorts of mm. things that are yes. these kinds of hyper object agents. So anyway, I just wanted to say all that. Um, but I, I also want to get into this really crucial aspect of uh, the illuminating and the receding aspect of all this, right? Which is in the elephant sun god and whatnot. And I think that that's really crucial as well, because it allows us to think about this whole process as basically if you reify the, the process itself as its own sacred phenomenon, uh, then we get a sense of, uh, let's call it the divine or the sacred that is basically uh, the process unfolding, right? And so we it doesn't need to be a thing that there is this, uh, this thing that we are totally ultimately aspiring to that will be achieved or something like that in some ultimate absolute way. It's that the absolute is the process itself of collective, or I should say, um, continual iterative, you know, recursive receding, recession and illumination or something, right? And that, that that is the nature of this sacred mystery of reality. That is the nature of the sort of, uh, you know, the, the depths and the profundity of, of the sacred mystery that whose, you know, whose depths can never fully be plumbed. And then you get this very uh, kind of mystical, apophatic appreciation for the sacred that is the very thing that is disclosing of itself, that is revealing itself through the learning process that we're talking about. Um, so anyway, th th those are a couple of points I wanted. Oh, the last thing I wanted to say briefly about that, and there are other things. I, I do want to talk about the individuals, uh, Greg, that you mentioned and the charisma and the and the the, the raising of the spirit as well. Um, but I just, just want to name as well that uh, John's question, I think, also gets at asking the question of, of Hmm, how do I want to say like the the target, the goal, the the even the continually moving target, the continually receding goal. But how do we think about uh, the where the direction, where the levels are are headed to, if that makes sense, right? And I think that this is a really important that starts to bring up issues around like o omega and the omega point and the questions like that that are uh, I think that can be handled in better or worse ways depending on how we make sense of them. But I want to in an, in a way that ties in with what I was just saying posit that we can think of the new God concept that we're potentially working with here as a an I iconic stand-in for whatever that infinitely receding and illuminating thing is. And we can call that something, we can call it Omega, we can call it the elephant sun God or what have you. But that orientation, I think, provides us something. And it, it is a re-symbolization and a reconceptualization of the sacred that I think can, can help us get a better uh, grip on reality uh, uh, for our moment. So anyway, there's there's too much there with other things there, but I'll just, I'll, I'll stop for now. So it, it seems to me then, given what you've just said, that the imaginal properly concerned now takes on a central role mm. uh, because the imaginal is exactly that which, right, um, is not uh, the assimilatory projection but mm. is the use of the image in order to sensitize us to, in order to augment our ability to perceive in an accommodating fashion. Mm. And the imaginal is precisely that which understands that whatever it is grasping, it is nevertheless, the, the thing grasp is also receding from it, or otherwise it wouldn't be imaginal, right? And so it, that seems to indicate the imaginal taking a, a important role which means not only are we pushing for a reconceptualization of what reason and meaning mean, we are also reconceptualizing. We're trying to liberate imagination from the way it is now sort of 
uh, generally all, almost by consensus conceived of that an imagination is mental pictures and it's a kind of withdrawal from reality and and and, and we're, we've disconnected it from its epistem epistemic and aspirational functions. So it seems to me that would be important. And then, given what you 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 were you were saying about the 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 way we're like you were exemplifying exactly what I was wanting to talk about. What I mean by that, you sort of did the reciprocal reconstruction around spirit. You just did it. You just did it, and we sort of done an earlier version of faith, and then th this is a this is a a question that I think we need to get at in order to address the question you raised about the sort of t loss that isn't a t loss kind of thing, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Which is, and I, I mean this in a Hegelian sense. So I'm trying to uh, like, on whose authority do we do these reciprocal reconstructions? Mm. Right. Where does where do we get? Right. So let's 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 all agree we're not going to use force or violence. We're not going to use duplicity. We're not going to manipulate people. Right. So what is it? This is kind of like I know this is like an L.A. Paul Agnes Keller question. Unless people have this vision, how could we get them to authorize mm -hmm. us to propose this vision such that they it, you, you see what i'm getting at there's mm -hmm. this is plato wrestled with this is the catch-22 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. problem of how mm -hmm. do you get people into philosophy if they're already not deeply interested in philosophy and i'm trying to do a version of that and i think that question I, i'm proposing that that question has to be addressed if we're going to get any sense of how we answer the t loss that is not the t loss question i don't know how that lands with the two of you but that's an argument i would make uh, that lands well with me. I mean, and I, I mean, I think you're, you know, let's go with the, let's stay with the theme, John, of that, uh, that for the two of us, at least, uh, enables a constructive opponent process. And they, I think you just laid out a structural uh, yeah. comment about where we are. That's very, very, uh, you know, uh, apropos uh, and feels very resonant. Um, so I'll, let me, let me throw out a logos content uh, in the form of the fifth joint point. Okay. Ah, yes, yes. All right. So in relationship to we, we need to feel our way into the imaginal in a particular type of way. And we need a collective awakening uh, in relation and we need to understand the underlying structure. Um, for me, I think maybe we can go a step further and we can actually say with a new grammar of understanding given by what what Brendan's laying out, what tree knowledge lays out. Uh, it's like, OK, energy and a matter. All right. There's a coalescing there of complexity. And then there's a you know, these information processing systems. This is what happened to me in 1998, six months after I sort of stumbled on the tree of knowledge. Like, what are these cones? Well, they're complex adaptive planes of existence that emerge as information processing communication networks, okay? And now, uh, and I'm hooked up with, uh, John, as you know, and Varun and uh, other people in Google of mine that uh, Jordan Hall hooked me up with. Um, and I'm talking with them. And basically what I was saying to Varun, who's, in, who's looking at this from an AI perspective, um, which, by the way, so just everyone knows, the fifth joint point is the idea that we're at a culture person plane of existence that's you know, centrally mediated, organized by our propositions that allow us to be culture persons as well as minded animals. And each one of these jumps is an in information processing. Well, what is the what, what what did we do in the 20th century? We laid down basically the interconnected digital world, and then we're generating independent artificial intelligences. And then things like chatbot are creating an active interface with our justification systems in a way that is just only going to increase through other kinds of cybernetic interfaces and whatnot. And so for me, the issue is the fifth joint point is a what I call wise naggy, which is wise, natural, artificial, general intelligence. OK, mm -hmm. so it's we what it says is we have to figure out the bridge. And John, in 2014, I think you did a TEDx talk yes. that basically did this exactly. You're like, it's wisdom and technology. And I would say wisdom naturally grounded and in an extended naturalism across a wisdom stack that ever recognizes where we are on the planet and what we're relating to. And now we find a chirotic moment of unbelievable transition through a new unbelievable infinite possibility uh, of a whole new complex adaptive plane and we have to grab the spirit of the moment to be oriented and somehow we have to sort of collectively wake up to that and allow a collective intelligence spirit orienting us into an imaginal possibility that 
you know, guides us towards the back half of the 21st century in a way that is wise. I, I want to pick up on that first, Brendan, if I may, because I think that's a brilliant proposal. Um, uh, it aligns with a, a video essay I did on um, uh, uh, on dealing with the advent of AGI and uh, also shameless plug with the book that's coming out called Mentoring the Machines. It's coming out very soon. Um, uh, maybe it's out by the time this video is out about just that. But what but but there's an argument in there specifically. I mean, there's an issue about how we get the alignment. And I think the answer ultimately has to be uh, like Greg was saying, we and it, it's it has to come from this but he, here's here's a proposal i hear greg now i don't know if you made this but i if you didn't i want you to have made it <laughs> which is <laughs> the, the 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 proposals that properly predictively prepare us for this so we can enter into right relationship wisely with this kairos are the proposals that should have authority now that's what i heard heard you saying in answer to my is, am i reading you correctly of course. Thank you. Because I think that's exactly right. It's interesting because when I was in, was in, when I was in the, 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 the Chino conference, uh, Paul Vanderclay made a similar argument that this, the, the, this little corner of the internet should be the place, the commons, not the market, not the state, but the commons from which we try to deal with the kairos of the advent of AGI. And those two things, I think, are deeply related proposals. I think that's right. I think I'm, in fact, I'm very satisfied. I'm sorry, Brendan. I know you want to answer, but I'm very satisfied with that as a proposal. I think at the, I think that's a general principle. Now that I think about it, Greg, I think this is brilliant insight. In the moment of in Kairos, what gets authority is that which can reliably, wisely, put you in right relationship to navigate through the Kairos. That's that's where you look for, and I think that's that's the right answer, Greg. Thank you. I think that's the right answer. Yeah, let me, so a couple of things I would also add to that. Um, I guess I'll talk about that. I'll speak to the authority aspect first, right? Which is, um, which I think is is the, the most immediate kernel that we're, we're grappling with here. I would say you mentioned earlier democracy and science as you sort mm -hmm. of collectively, yes. um, a collective agency. Uh, yeah, only project. science can only science can discover and track global warming. No one sure. individual can do it. Only democracy can organize collective active action problems and distributed labor across a nation state with different regions of demo geography, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd want to posit or suggest that there is a, a kind of intrinsic authority that em I'll, I'll, I'll try this and then we'll see where it goes. A kind of intrinsic authority that that uh, emerges as reality discloses itself, which is I don't want to say self-justificatory, but um, I'll give you an example. Right. I mean, we when we when we talk about the production of scientific knowledge, uh, and and someone presents a paper and they make a claim about reality, we don't, you know, stand to our feet and yell, who gave you the authority to say this about reality, right? Uh, because it, it's a different uh, authorization going on there that it's not- uh, I disagree. Some... I disagree. We do, right? We, we fundamentally do. We require them to have fit into a tradition of precedence and provenance, and mm -hmm. we require them to be trying to make sense in a plausible manner which means taking into account alternative positions, potential confounds that are coming from the alternative theories proposed by other people. We, yeah. So I, I do think, but I do but, think there, there, like there's a lot of stuff they have to do uh, in order to have the authority to make the pronouncement. Do, do you think that they successfully wind up justifying their pronouncements or do you feel like even uh, at like I think, a philosophy right. of science level we we haven't really come up with a good answer for that well no i think you're right but i but uh, so I, I, here's what i think i'm i'm seeing and i and i think i'm agreeing with you but i i wanted to make sure that i don't think it's an either or i think it's an and yeah. because i think you're invoking ontonormativity that you know mm. we have this meta desire that whatever is bringing us police a coherence agency is also real. And when we encounter the really real, we transform ourselves. I think the mm. sense of, that real is simultaneously an ontological and a normative thing. The mm -hmm. thing isn't the right word, but I don't have the right word. And so I yeah. think when we get a sense of coming into contact with something more real, more intelligibility, it has that kind of authority. But I don't think 
that comes at us atomically. I think it yeah. always comes woven yeah. within, yeah. right? All right. this, right? Yeah, All yeah. this other stuff. No, thank you. So you did a much better job saying that than I was trying to do, which is basically that. And I think that what I'm trying to get at is that that to me seems um, like the authority that that for me makes sense in those situations, right? It, it, and what could ground a kind of reconstructive effort like we're talking about, because we're literally talking about enshrining that process. Yeah, yeah. So there's an intrinsic aspect in which we are affirming the very thing that would give us the authority to justify ourselves doing anything like this. And it's because of the architecture of meaning making and the normativity uh, and the values that are kind of, again, intrinsically caught up up in entities more successively, successfully trying to navigate their environments by processing information and gaining a more full and rich disclosure of reality. Um, so, so for me, I, I I see that as being part of the justification is is wrapped up with with its oh, own. Okay, so we could put the, we could put Greg's and that proposal. To, given the way you've allowed me to qualify it, then I'm I'm back in agreement with it. And then we could say it's it, it's like it's like. Uh, 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 well, it's almost like I was going to say like Piagetting assimilation and accommodation. But anyways, I mean, we could say that that which has authority, right? There's a perennial aspect to it, which is the perennial aspect is it, you know, it increases intelligibility and puts us under onto normativity. But there's also a pertinent aspect to it, which is, yes, but it should be putting us in contact with onto normativity in a way that is deeply relevant to the kairos we're in yeah and then you could put the two together in that fashion yeah. yeah and i guess what i would posit too that's really important about this is i think one that this does kind of break down into at least two really important aspects to this question one is 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 a kind of philosophical justification uh the other is sort of just the strategic like what would work so like well i might totally assent to your notion that uh, in moments of Kairos, then, you know, it should be the wisdom that blah, 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 yeah. blah, everything you said, that sounds great. But if other people don't hold that, then yeah, it yeah, doesn't yeah. have a strategic success, right? So one of the things that um, I think uh, is related to both of these aspects, though, is that when we appreciate that there is a leveled ontology, when we appreciate that then there are also different levels of epistemic relationship to reality, oh, yeah. right? Good. Then we need to fold those into uh whatever justifications we're going to be thinking about, certainly at a strategic level, right? And so, so for example, I mean, what, what we're talking about here, I think does naturally, I'll just use that word, uh, disclose itself as you kind of dig deeper into that, you know, that edge of chaos and you start moving, right? It starts to disclose itself and you're like, so I'm, I'm satisfied with the justification of that coming through. But what I think then needs to happen, and this is actually part of this kind of maybe a really important part of this coming back in and grounding these ideas in the culture and whatnot is being able to translate this idea into the different logics that exist through the learning process. Right. So for example, um, you know, and and I think this is something that both Greg and I are really engaged in is the mythopoeic expressions of of the of the different sort of yes. uh, you know logoi that we're working with, which the logo are basically the same, but the myths are different, um, and and that itself has justification when we think about this whole element of this being iconographic, and and it's not about the the symbol is just the symbol and all this sort of a thing. But but yeah, just to just to really yeah, quickly yeah. finish. No no off, no, just, no, this is great. So Keep like going. yeah, so like. So if you frame what we're talking about, not in terms of recursive emergence and relevance realization, et cetera, et cetera, but in something in a language more mythic, like God is waking up uh, or the self and the universe are coming into communion, or there's a, there's a love story uh, underway between the mind and, and, and the universe or reality or what have you. Right. And the, and the imaginal framing of mm. of of this architecture that we're speaking to which is translatable and and emotional and grounded and embodied in a way that is that is also then therefore more robust and can speak to the whole level of sort of the epistemic stack which is re really another term for or I should say is manifested in terms of of um of society of the, of the collective that we live in right i mean there there's a a plurality of different modes uh, of mm -hmm. engaging reality in all these different ways and if we're if we are justifiably speaking with authority because it's a disclosure of reality i think one of the the impetuses is to translate that into language that is communicable uh down the stack does that make sense and then i think yeah. this yeah i want i want to grab this all of this then that that was another good point so i'm hearing this 
right? Right. We, we, we need the imaginal that can home us in the perennial ontonormativity mm. that can orient us towards the horizon of the Kairos and that can commune across different levels of the ontology and the ep uh, and the epistemine. Is that is that what mm. I'm getting? Right. Probably. That, yes. Yes. That, that's yes. very good. That's very good. Now it does open a, 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 a an issue, which I think you specifically, John, might might have problems with, because I know you've often struggled with the issue of equivocation in religious language, right? Yes. Is Thomas Aquinas's God the same as you know uh, the Sunday well, school? Well, yeah. This but, been, my argument against Paul when he says, you know, Christianity yeah. does this, and I said, but does Christianity really do this, or does it just equivocate, right? Well, All right, right. Yeah. And I, I feel like we might have to be open to, or maybe even celebratory of the power of equivocation to be uh acting as this translating uh mechanism if that makes sense right if we're well, able yeah i have a couple i have a counter proposal to you <laughs> which is a theoretical alternative to equivocation which is something that uh, you know which i learned and i exemplify but i learned it from nishitani which is not equivocation but double entendre a double mm -hmm. meaning mm -hmm. like how mm -hmm. i use realization yeah mm -hmm. right that's that mm. that instead of equivocation but of course that's just one move but we could find things that are multi-layered yes. yes. in that that kind of capacity and of course right. words typically logos to use a classical example is exactly that logo mm. it's not an equivocation they mm. people aren't equivocating they are trying to evoke all of these different possible meanings because they're not antithetical to each other they're all in concert together mm. so when john is saying you know nice. in the beginning was the was the logos he's trying mm. to invoke yeah all of this yeah. he's not equivocating yeah. Yeah. see and i think yeah. and that, to, to me that reminds me what young right and tillich talk about how how symbols are actually they're not equivocal they're condensed they're and i think that's mm. what they were trying to get at so yes. that's what i would offer as a counter proposal yeah. And the last thing I'll say before I want to get Greg in here, too, is is that a, a, a multi-layered reality requires a multi-layered, not just map of that reality, but a symbolic articulation of that reality so that the sacred is multi-layered and it demands to be expressed in multi-layered form. And so I think that that's what we're getting at here is that what language, what imaginal language could do that, could work through all those different layers. I think that uh, that sort of it, it helps clarify in some ways the, the task. Just one thing before Greg replies, which is yes, but I think we can do that without having to license equivocation because licensing yeah. equivocation opens us up to all kinds of bullshit and self-deception. Sure. Right. So I think there's a way yeah. around that too. Yeah. So now I'll be quiet. I mean, I'm soaking this in. This is beautiful. Uh, and so, and and I, I th for me the for me the issue is one of translation. But I will certainly say, uh, John, the double entendre. I mean, the when I found out the meta modern uh, sensibility, sincere irony. Okay, mm. uh, it was when I that's what it, that's what I was called to to, to It's a cartoon and a garden and a theory of knowledge for the 21st century. I mean, what the, it, it's actually all those things, it, it, depending on how you hold that, you know, in a particular sort of way. So there is a, the multifaceted double entrana a meaning. And I think, but Brendan's point, and this is a real struggle, like I have, my, learning my system is not easy, <laughs> you know, and then people get it wrong. And they're like, when well, you know, I got it wrong, what do you mean by justification? Well, I got to get in there and be very clear if it's going to generalize reliability and validity. And at the same time, we have to figure out ways. So to me, one of our tasks, folks, is, is at the core of this issue of like, what is the right resonant frequency to wake up the zeitgeist with the right line that affords the capacity to gather the, the numbers of individuals across the space? spectrum of interest, attention, culture, functioning, et cetera, uh, that wake up with the resonance at the right time. Uh, and that's a, to me, that's part of the kairos of the moment, because I, I think there are issues of fundamental time. I will say I get a lot of mileage going energy, matter, life, mind, culture, digital, instead of mind, matter versus mind, right? Like we can, re I would say we can, at one level of logos, I think we can wake up with an enormous amount mm -hmm. of uh, clarity and say, well, going from culture to digital, everyone can see that. I mean, there's a, you can really grab that. So what are the right framings across a wide variety of different rituals, participatory knowledge, 
uh, you know, justificatory knowledge, etc., uh, that that do, does this job of double entendre what uh, to afford lots of different meanings to be held together, but has a crisp enough logos all the way down that holds a reliable and general truth claim. I, I think those are just brilliant and powerful reflections, and I think that this is what this is all about. There's a transcendent national fundamentally about asking these kinds of questions and groping toward them. So it's very exciting. Yeah, I also think that. Um we need to be comfortable also with the reality that um, more complex formulations or articulations of the real uh, will, I don't want to say be untranslatable, uh, but we have to be comfortable with where those translations break down as well, right? I mean, uh, there's a whole way in which um, we learn models that get us the next uh, that next level right and then we throw that away and we get the next one from there and we need these intermediaries right if you think of like Bohr's model of the atom it's like oh that's great by the way that's not how an atom works at all right but that's still what you learn this is like the 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 ladder that we throw mm -hmm. away of Wittgenstein and all that right it's it's so we need to build that into our appreciation for this as well and not um there there's a a, a way in which we have to accept that whatever will be particularly the most, uh, at, for the time being, let's say, the most complex framing of something. Uh, yeah, that might just be required jargon and rather heady conceptual ideas. And that shouldn't necessarily speak against it, as long as that's also able to find resonance further down at multiple other uh, layers of, of expression, uh, so that it's not just sitting up in the cloud somewhere as as this you know sort of idea. And then that, that, that is, I think, a, both a philosophical and a kind of strategic consideration that we, we would have to think about. Absolutely. So, so uh, I think I, I, I'm this whole answer, like like I said, the you know the ontonormative perennial home and the chirotic, you know, prospective uh, calling, and then then the, the getting the the communal resonance um, um, as the the basis of authority and we I mean we reciprocally recognize with all of these poles pulling on us um and we and we respect those who are being pulled by them um I think that's a really good answer um so I'm wondering then or unless you want to go somewhere but or do you want me to frame a question well I have a thought but I'm also you know necessarily very interested in what that question would be I'll just throw this out of there and then we can throw say the, if we do wanna... your thought first that's great uh, yeah just my thought is um uh, I guess to use myself as an example of where the translation works in my life, and I think this also addresses a little bit of some of that aporia that we that we uh, kind of broached the last time, and the potential despair and all these things, right? Which is that for me personally, I find it incredibly meaningful to be engaged in this process, to be a part of this process, and to make sense of the world in this way, so that it works at a visceral, embodied level, and that I can I am very comfortable using language. Uh, through symbolic language, but but with a deep reality to it as well, that there is some process underway in which uh, reality is coming to know itself, right? As 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 Carl Sagan said that you know we are a way for the cosmos to know itself, um, and thinking about this process as a cosmic process unfolding in the universe, um, it seems to work for me at the logos level and the mythos level in a way that I'm very comfortable making those uh, register leaps. And so that to me speaks to something that like, this is, this, this is something I get out of bed for, uh, you know, this is something that engages me uh, as a meaningful enterprise and a, a meaningful way to frame my own existence uh, in reality, which is both a meaning in my life, but it is also a framing that does give a meaning to my life because I'm able to con to situate this activity within an ultimate environment that goes beyond me that I am part of. And uh, so I just wanted to name that too, because I also didn't want to give the impression that like, uh, you know, that, that, yeah, that, that platonic issue of like, oh, well, the philosopher Kings will come up with the myths and then they'll trickle down to the people. Right. It's like, no, like it, it needs to work at a, at a em embodied lived reality. Uh, these truths that are being disclosed about about reality in some important way. And uh, I just wanted to kind of throw that into the, into well, the room. That's a great segue for my question. And thank cool. you for Perfect. sort of your Kierkegaardian <laughs> stance. Like this, <laughs> I, this, this, I now, this is not an abstract system. This is, I live this and I have decided for it. But I mean, what what you're invoking and what we, what we got to last time was a reconstruction of the notion of faith 
And of course, this is why I'm asking the question of authority, because faith mm -hmm. and authority have often been uh, there's certain. Let me put it this way: certain conceptions of faith, certain conceptions of authority, certain conceptions of the relationship between them have been used to denigrate and suppress mm -hmm. reason. In, in not in the Cartesian sense, but in the broader sense we've been talking about here. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I wanted to get. I wanted to get given, and I think you just did it wonderfully. And I take what you just did, given how we used the term last time, that was your statement of faith, mm -hmm. right? And that was your statement of faith. And then that statement of faith is in relationship to a certain kind of authority that we've been talking about. And then I want to know, okay, but where's the third uh, in this model, which is, you know, in what what now that we've reconfigured those two and their relationship together, what happens to the third, which is the lo with is logos reason in this more Socratic Platonic sense, not the Cartesian computation, but this larger sense of you know uh, overcoming foolishness, uh, connecting deeply to what is most real, uh, aspiring all that stuff that we've been talking about, uh, mm -hmm. especially when we now made a case. For the for the indispensability, maybe even the metaphysical necessity, but at least the uh, uh, indispensability of the imaginal. What now happens to our conception of logos ratio, right? Like what what happens there? If that's I mean, the question I wanted to ask. Yeah, I mean, for me, <laughs> I've I've tried to articulate this before, and I don't know if it's exciting or um, disappointing to people. But when people ask about spiritual practices, for me, it's learning, right? It's it's it is engaging with more of reality of of accommodating myself more to what is. And so, um, what it does, I think, in that yeah broader sense of reason, is it it it's no longer well. <sighs> You know, it's it's dangerous to talk about exactly how people conceived of these things in the past, right? But there's a sense in which kind of ancient theology, right, used to be uh, faith-seeking understanding. It was almost a sense of like there was this pre-given set of uh, kind of belief structures that then needed to find, you needed to bring the reason to, to kind of, uh, yeah. and I mean, that's a very complex issue, right? But but there is an element of which that, that sort of affected the way people made sense of their religious landscape. And I think that this kind of turns that on its head in a way that sort of sacralizes reason, uh, sacralizes intelligibility or sacralizes yes, yes. the, the disclosing the, the search for knowledge, right? I mean, if you're, if you're, if you are an epistemic agent situated in this tree of knowledge and you're relating to it and, and the whole thing is this profound relationship between subjects and objects engaging uh, transjectively each other and disclosing more of what's going on. And that being something that seems to be built into this sort of recursive mechanics or architecture of reality and, yes, and existence. Yes, yes. And so that to me is is profound and beautiful and starts to sync up and plug into various mystical notions of the, the subjective and the objective and the unification and, and all these sorts of things. So Long story short, for me, um, yeah, when I when I learn more, when I expand my horizon, when I am forced to accommodate, when I'm challenged, right, and I and I have to grapple with something that was no longer the case, when my worldview collapses, that is actually a instance of a a calling forth towards a more transcendent potential, right, and that I think is a very different way of looking at these sorts of things than. Uh, different older conceptions of faith as sort of, uh, you know, well, I don't want to be mean to St. Paul, but some, you know, uh, more that 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 kind of sense of uh, faith is belief and things not, you know, seen and that sort of a thing, right? This yes. is actually, as things become seen, they engender a deeper faith in the profound yes. logic of the entire process, I guess. And so uh, that for me is, is how I, I would think about that. So is that where the, the the rational is, is that there is this, like rationality is a normative term. Like it tells you, it, 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 the idea is we have some guidance as to when we're getting it right and when we're getting it wrong mm -hmm. with respect to how reality really is kind of thing. Uh, and I'm trying to use a very neutral term because of course, truth is a terribly contested term, uh, et cetera. Um, and, I, I, and I'm getting a sense, but I'm, I'm like, what would it be like if somebody came to you and, and said, you know, well, isn't just all of religion just irrational by nature? 
right? And uh, and yes, you're talking about faith and authority, but like that's exactly why I don't go to church, mm. right? Uh, 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 you see what I'm trying to get at? I, yeah. And this goes yeah. to the strategic. You see, I've been doing a lot to try and argue, no, no, the rational and the imaginal are just interdependent. You can't have one without the other. Um, and, and that, um, and, and that uh, rationality is about uh, uh, ultimately about trying to conform the grammar of cognition to the grammar of reality. Um, and that's what we're talking about here. And, and faith yeah. and authority, as we've reconstructed them, are both in this. Sorry, you Speed. Well, just no. I think this is the essence of this whole series that you're doing. How do we yes. how do we naturalize transcendence, and so that it's no ah. longer isn't religion some you know fantastical nonsense? It's like, no, whatever religion is must be the most real thing that we can conceive of, right? I mean, the yeah. sacred is real, and I think that that's yeah. the we're not just we Excellent. need to we need to naturalize this in order for it to be real because there's a deep metaphor physical relationship between what we're what we're i don't want to say presupposing here because we're we're the the, the context of the series presupposes this uh yeah, metaphysical yeah. naturalism for good reason right but it's not like we're trying to necessarily hammer home some metaphysical idea that only matters because those are the things that are real and if we can't articulate notions of the sacred and the spiritual and the religious in terms that are real and not just that are real but that are that are like the most real, <laughs> you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, like yeah. there's a, the intimation towards the uh to further realness, uh, then yeah, that then we're then we're we're not talking about and, and I and I think that one of the interesting things that's about here too is that why do people think that? And I want to posit that, and this isn't a unique observation, but because religion has been an ongoing process of the entire human uh, learning process and the cultural process of, of, of that learning. And so when people think about these uh, religious ideas, they're largely gesturing to older kind of deposited collective realization yes. or, you know, um, collective representations that have not been updated in light of these other things. And so because of that, there's a jarring nature of, oh, well, no, there's real stuff. And then there's that old uh, religious stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But the whole endeavor that I think is being approached here, this whole broader conversation that's happening here, but also, you know, in this broader space is... No, no, no. Those things need to be in alignment, right? We need that. We need something like that old, you know, alignment between the the Neoplatonic with the Aristotelian science and all this stuff. Yeah, we need to yeah. whatever our religious conceptions are need to be in accord with uh with with what is real. And so, um, I think that the challenge is being able to bring in those older collective representations in a meaningful way, so that we don't lose everyone who's maybe still working with those, right. and then, but also be able to keep pushing that, you know, that, that edge of, of chaos and keep, you know, uh, expanding our world model further. So that's as a part of it. You have a facility yeah. for giving great answers to my questions. <laughs> really, Probably, probably uh, 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 owing to having watched so many of your podcasts and lectures. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, whatever. But um, I mean, that, that, that was a very good answer. Yeah. Very happy. I, I want to give space to Greg now. Well, I mean, again, I, I'm, deeply enjoying this. So um, here's, I'll, I'll share from the sort of the Utah story in relationship to this. And that is, you know, I, you know, I bought science mostly. Uh, and then, uh, you know, and now looking back, it's like, wait, well, science did unbelievable things with physics, but it also generated our enlightenment gap. Okay. It, it doesn't afford a clarity of subjective, qualitative knowing, intersubjective narrative and the impact that that has. It doesn't have a theory of physicists. It's got physics, but no theory of physicists. And, and as a function of that, it's obviously inadequate in relationship to grounding our fundamental relevance realization across all the modes of being in the world. Uh, we don't have a consilient picture. Uh, and that's what I feel like I backed into ultimately as I, you know, uh, struggled and we wait a minute there's no psychology breaks down uh, uh, it's the logos of psychology breaks down and it doesn't know how to relate to the psyche and it doesn't really know how to relate to the stories we generated and we don't have the right framing that puts in right relation uh, the scientific logos of the world our subjective pathos and our collective mythos mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately that's what you talk does with its tree coin and yes. garden it it says hey justify the world through a particular third person behavioral objective epistemology that's great that utilizes certain things is clapping with one hand in relationship by the definition it plays a particular kind of language game as many insights as it gives it also is not obviously complete 
but the, the, the whole point of factoring out a qualitative unique, it, it characterizes your pathos as, as error, basically. And yet from a pathic perspective, my life is what's relevant uh, to me. And we obviously need frameworks that enable us to understand what is error from one vantage point may not be uh, from another at all. And, and what it, is there facts? There's only facts over here. And of course, that's not true of their epidemic values, but it is deeply limited in telling in the whole co-construction of morality, ethics, aesthetics, et cetera. It's, it's not well-structured science, that is, physics in particular, is not structured that way. But those things are all part of the relevance realization machinery. Uh, and so the question for my vantage point is, what are, how do those things dance together? Why? And the argument is a, a transjective epistemology that places objective, subjective, intersubjective, collective in relation, recognizes those as vectors, recognize that they're, they're actually taking place over time. Then uh, we, we're in a much better place, especially with an emergent, synoptic, integrative cognitive science psychology vantage point that then is a meta modern spirituality. We're in a much, much better place uh, to see through these vectors and see how they're complementary rather than in conflict or, or fundamentally broken in relationship to their capacity to uh, dance with one another and give us a full rich picture uh, of both how we understand the world and live our lives. Yeah, I think that that foregrounds something that's really important, which is another meaningful distinction that this broader conversation and the one we're having here and the series is having is not uh, I think a more modern question, which is how do we uh, make religion rational? Maybe more in that Cartesian sense, right? How do we how do we make religion uh, uh, scientific, right? And there was a, a whole effort to try to demythologize religion and to basically apply just scientific models mm -hmm. uh, with with their given epistemology to that issue. And, and that's a smaller question, and it ultimately leads to the same errors that you're talking about, Greg. That you get you'll get a, you'll get a religion of the, of the Enlightenment gap that way, right? So there needs to be um, you know this broader. I think that's why. Uh, uh, you know, naturalism is a nice word that helps frame the broader context in which science is operating, but not with its sort of limited epistemology. Um, so it is rational in the broad, you mm -hmm. know, logic, intelligible, you know, sense, but not in in, in sort of a crude, simplistic, scientific uh, sense that loses uh, the subject. That's great. Uh, that's I, I like. I'm very happy with this. We're moving towards the end of our time. Um, first of all, uh, as always, thank you, Greg. It's just fa it's fantastic uh, to keep you know, our work together going. But especially, yeah, I wanted to thank uh, Brendan, and I wanted to give both of you, maybe Greg first, and then Brendan, as always, just uh, uh, a chance for a final word. But I just want to say one more time, Brendan, this, this has been really just superlative, just fantastic. Really deeply appreciative of your work. So I'll, I'll turn things over uh, to, to Greg first, and then he'll pass it to you for your final word. Amen. I mean, uh, this has been a joy, both uh, both uh, rich, informative, uh, uh, giving me new angles uh, to frame uh, a rich, you know, I like a coherent, integrated pluralism. Uh, and I feel like that has been deepened uh, and, and clarified. Uh, I mean, some of the things that I, I think that are you've laid out, Brendan, in relationship to sort of the, the reconstruction of meaning of meaning and framing and as learning and framing as this sort of unfolding and bringing John's work and my work together and then situating that into sort of a, a waking up to the Kairos of the moment. I mean, it, it is a brilliant articulation of what we're looking for with transcendent naturalism, uh, both in terms of the, the core logos grounding and the implications for where we are. And I think the great question for all, all of us uh, is, you know, kind of, well, what does it mean? Well, both for our lives and then what what do we do? I think we're grappling with that. I think you're grappling and embodying that in, in the way you live, uh, you know, at, at Sky Meadow uh, and, the, and the retreats that you do and the callings that you offer folks uh, to come together and reflect on. Uh, and it's been an honor and a pleasure. Gosh, thank you for that. I thank you both for this. This was an incredible uh, opportunity. It's uh, clearly a topic that I'm very passionate about and engaged very uh, deeply in. And um, yeah, I, uh, I, I both. I guess I also I just want to end by thanking you both for your work, uh, which has been you know sort of talking about talk about leveling up. You know, you got to stand on on uh, on shoulders to 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 get there. And so um, I appreciate so much of the clarity that uh, both of 
both of your works bring. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, there, there's an ongoing conversation here. I look forward to watching the rest of the series and who else you talk to. Um, but, uh, but this was great and I really appreciate the opportunity and, um, gosh, there's so much more that could be said, but I, I, I'm deeply, deeply grateful. Wonderful.